There was a time when I was willing to kind of play along with some of these inventors with their secret proclivities. That was a decade ago. At this point, the answer is no, no, yet, never, ain't gonna happen. And the reason is, if I know what the result is going to be at the end, you'd be insane to start it at the beginning. <laughs> All right? So it isn't for nothing that since 1990, and 1993, I've been having meetings and doing briefings for the head of Army Intelligence and the CIA director and putting together presidential briefings and moving around with, you know, getting Rockefeller to host the Clintons at the ranch to go through all this stuff with them. Some of this you know, some you don't. But you learn through those lessons. And what I have learned is where I started. Disclosure, complete openness about all these technologies, you cannot fix this problem from the consciousness that created it. And greed, avarice, secrecy, that's what's gotten us where we are. That is at the core of the massive oil, fossil fuel, national security superstate that ha we have built up around us. So if you use that same consciousness, you're not going to escape from that black hole. So we have to have a whole new consciousness that guides these endeavors, or we're going to repeat history over and over and over and over again. And that is the great tragedy of our time, is that because this subject is sort of the stepchild of science, and there has been a divide and conquer nature to all these inventors who, one will pop up in England, one will pop up like Stan Meyer in the Midwest, one will pop up in Australia, one will pop up in South America. And there are all these sort of lone wolves out there that are easy to pick off one at a time. So we have to come together as a people and do this very overtly, not secretively, with a proper uh, public involvement because the public wants this. 99%, 99.9% 9 .9 of the, pup, the people on planet Earth would benefit from this. There is a very, very, it's not the 1%, it's the 0.0000000001% who would not benefit from this because they are the ones sitting atop the petrodollar system, the macroeconomic order, and particularly the fact that it is run, and everything we're using is run, on a metered, linear energy source, even solar and wind. The big $2 billion uh, solar farm being done out in the desert of California. I mean, that's a huge thing, but it's all centralized with a centralized utility. What happens when you have something that would fit on this table and it will run your house? Pulling energy from the quantum vacuum or the zero point energy field. You don't need utilities. How many people have stock portfolios with utilities in them? Bye-bye. You don't need ExxonMobil. <laughs> you don't need BP. You do not need coal. So there goes all of Australia's coal exports to China. Unnecessary. Don't need it. On and on and on and on it goes. So there would be an impact. But if we don't do it, the impact we're facing is a thousand times worse, which is a geopolitical order where we're, you're likely to see a war in the South China Sea over oil deposits, where we have this situation now in the Ukraine and Crimea and with Russian gas and Europe needing it, the Middle East conundrum, on and on it goes. So beneath that is a deeper crisis. True statistic, 48% of inhabitants of Earth do not have indoor plumbing. So the old saying, don't have a pot to pee in, literally 48% of the 7 billion people on Earth. So we have this growing disparity between the people who have things and those who do not. But that is what happens, and it gets very extreme before every massive global revolution or war, like in the 20s before the Third Reich rose. Uh, I think we have to begin to look at this and say, how can we stay on this path when the outcome is huge problems with the environment, even if you don't believe in climate change as a result of fossil fuel, 
these other issues are going to catch us before that does. So long before we have a problem with the client, which actually we're having a problem, the UN report that came out this week makes it quite clear. But even if you don't accept that in your paradigm, the inhumanity of keeping these sciences and technologies away from the public and the poverty that it engenders. Because I was talking to an industrialist from India and he was telling me it would take trillions of dollars to properly electrify the subcontinent so that people have the, the energy they need using the, today's conventional systems, even solar, even wind, even coal. And, you know, we're looking, facing a situation now that every year or two there's a thousand new coal-fired burning uh, power plants being put online in India, China, and elsewhere, mostly without any scrubbers. So in the Pacific Northwest and other places, you have a huge amount of the pollution that's in the West Coast is coming from Asia because there's no scrubbers in those occult. And you look at the air in, in Beijing and Shanghai and other cities, it's, it's, it's not breathable. Then you go to the oceans where you have the Fukushima reactor releasing all this radioactive material and huge parts of the oceans, because there's all the CO2 going into the oceans, are beginning to die because of the acidity and alkaline levels being upset. So there are all these big macro geophysical effects while we're trying to maintain the current macroeconomic order. Big problem, huge mistake. But who's going to fix it? This, this is really the crux of the problem. Now many people have asked me, given the folks I've met with over the years, why doesn't someone do that? But see, everyone says that. My wife and I this week were just up in New York meeting with the head of a foundation. And the question came up frequently with people there, all of whom were incredibly wealthy. Well, why doesn't Bill Gates do it? Or why doesn't the president? It's always, why doesn't someone else? Of course, if you go to the president, he'll say, <laughs> no way, Jose. And if you go to billionaire X and billionaire Y and billionaire Z, many of whom I've met with, they'll go, you know, one of them once said to me, we all want to be first to be second. <laughs> Great expression. You hear it a lot in business. When it's a very controversial science, no one wants to be the first to stick their neck out. So this becomes then a leadership issue, which is, what I've tried to provide some clarity to in my own humble way, being not a significantly wealthy or powerful person at all, but knowing what I know, try to share it with the public and try to create a momentum towards disclosure, not only of the fact that we're not alone in the universe, but that the secret behind these UFO propulsion systems and, and energy systems would give us an entirely new planet, beautiful. But there are stakeholders who are very, very powerful who aren't happy about that. Now, you know, at the World Economic Forum at Davos a few months ago, a couple of months ago, it came out that there was about 17, they said 35, but it's actually more like 32, and the Swiss Institute said more like 17 people and corporations that those people control that have about 50, the equivalent of the net worth of the lowest 50% of the world's population, um, which is true. And some of these folks I have met with and briefed over the years, and in fact, very recently. As some of you may have heard, um, I, I can't go into any details about it, I was asked to go to a, an island in the last few months um, with about 120 world leaders and um, people from Goldman Sachs and McKinsey and Boston Consulting Group and various people. And um, I wasn't allowed to bring any, any assistance or, I could have brought my wife, but it was too, she didn't feel like she didn't like traveling so much. And so I went by myself and it was daunting, <laughs> not because of who was there, but what the task was, because there were either people there who knew that this existed and were seething that I was on the agenda, or there were people who knew nothing about it and had no foundation for understanding it, and I had 45 minutes to discuss it. <laughs> now, you know, that's the nature of these kind of confabs, if you've ever been to any of those sort of things, but, uh, we made a lot of progress with that because the head of this institute that hosts this event every year ended up uh, asking us to take the Disclosure Project, a uh, two-hour DVD that has all, you know, dozens and dozens of these military witnesses and also has the 
a brief, the presidential briefing document, the early ones that we put together in there, embedded in a PDF file, and sent it to the top 50 people who were there. So and that was recently, or, or 30 people. So we're, we're, we're continuing that educational process. But time and time and time again, whether I'm, uh, I was, in LA I was given a talk to a group and there were about 110 people there, but 12 of them were billionaires. And every single one of them would say, well, I wouldn't want to do something like this, but so-and-so might. And it's kind of like the little red hen, you know? Everyone would like to see this happen, nobody wants to do it. And, and so uh, that, you know, it, it's kind of comical, and I kind of feel like, you know, Lawrence Rockefeller, back in 93, turned to me, in, or 94, 20 years ago, and he says, don't leave your medical career because really no one's going to take any risk with something this controversial. And, you know, you'll, you'll just end up being the court jester for a lot of the public and a, and a lot of the, 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 the elites. Not court jester, but, you know, information or infotainment, but no one's really, really going to stick their neck out on this because this is too heavy a lift. And I, I was appalled at his cynicism. And 20 years later, I go, you know, the guy, old guy was right. Um, it's sort of a, a, a sad view of, 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 of that situation. But ultimately, I have to take the view that we as a people can still do this. I'm the eternal optimist. You have to be if you're an emergency doctor. You know, you're working everything to save that three-year-old child. Um, and <laughs> believe you can, and you can't do sometimes. Uh, and sometimes you can't. But that's the mindset of an emergency Position. And I think that we, what we have to look at is, is what does it take to do something wonderful for our children and our children's children? And it can't be the consciousness of what's in it for me. And that's, of course, the whole concept of venture capital and, and most technological plays. Um, for example, here's a mistake many people have made. They come up with one of these systems, maybe it's a prototype that's only putting out 100 watts of, quote, free energy that's coming from the vacuum, i.e. over what's going into it. So say, let's, you know, there's 10 watts going in and 100 watts coming out. I know many people, there's a man at, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs who had done this. Um, and they get approached by someone who says, oh, well, work with me, and we're a VC group, and here's $50 million for a startup. Guess what? Those folks are either shilling, they're fronting for the intelligence community, or they're sincere, but then someone comes in later with $5 billion and buys them out. I met with such a man not long ago at my home in Virginia, out at our farm, and he says, oh, yeah, well, you know, $50 million wouldn't be a problem, but I would want to have control over the corporation and the technology. I said, I don't think that's really a good idea. Have you ever gone mano a mano with the national security state? He says, no, but I've done lots of, you know, apps and, you know, stuff. And, you know, he thought this was like coming out with a new iPhone app. <laughs> uh, not, uh, so that's how little he understood about what, was, what we're facing here. And I said, well, the problem with that is, let me just ask, ask you a question. If you put $50 million into that research and development program and came out with a prototype of something that would run people's homes, take them off the grid, self-sufficiency, lift the third world out of poverty in three, four years, five years at the most, with the way technologies can spread today in the world. He, but someone offered you $5 billion for your $50 million funding. What would you do? He says, I'm a businessman. I would sell. I said, no, you're a money whore, and you have just sold out the future of the world to another front organization that's going to bury it. Now, there's a term for this in our community that I use called black shelving. Black shelving means a corporate interest will buy up a technology because it is a threat to other horizontally and vertically integrated parts of their corporate structure and just put it on a black shelf and keep it there. Now, there's a man who's a 747 pilot for United Airlines who's retired now, but he grew up with a gentleman who was inventing amazingly efficient carburetors in the 50s that were getting these heavy clunker cars, you know, those great big cars that were running and getting 80, 90 miles per gallon because of some of these electromagnetic 
things that he was in. Well, the auto companies and the oil companies kept buying him out. And he retired on that money. And his attitude was, I got mine, I'm rich now. One of the scientists, a lieutenant colonel down near uh, the Huntsville Space Flight Center, Redstone Arsenal, Alabama, I was at his home, and he has worked a great deal in this area uh, in, in classified projects. And he, he was looking at one. It was a, a gentleman who had an electromagnetic motor. And he tested it. And this is a PhD physicist, by the way. He said, this was the real thing. This was not one of these frauds and tricks that are out there on the internet, most of which we'll get to in a moment are tr tricks and frauds. And he said, this was the real thing. The guy disappeared for a few months, and next time he saw him, the guy had a Lamborghini and Armani suit, seriously, and wouldn't even talk to this physicist, and said, I can't talk about that technology. It's been sold. That was in the 80s. That was 30-some years ago. Now there's another part. So if you, make it, if you get past the national security apparatus, there are all these business traps where if the money is initially clean, but the entity is controlled by people who are mainly interested in money and power, they're going to sell to someone who will black shelve it. It's not if that will happen, it's when. Because we have documented that this has happened over and over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm.